You've probably already seen the headline that 40 out of 49 Starlink satellites from the launch last week have been destroyed due to a solar storm. SpaceX made the announcement, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper into this and get some analysis from our favorite resident expert, Jonathan McDowell. He was in between his interviews with the major networks and I was able to snag about 20 minutes with him. So I wanted to ask him more about this since we know it's crucial that we get more of those V2 satellites up into low earth orbit and as we have increased solar activity. So let's get right into it. Yeah, I feel like, first of all, some people are confused because they see, oh my gosh, 80% of the satellites are destroyed. It's like, okay, of this one launch, you know, so. This one launch, yeah, yeah. And you know, I think, the first thing to say is that this is not in itself going to be such a big hit to SpaceX because right. their business case has to have taken into account the chance that, you know, one of these boosters that they're launching for the 10th time goes bang on the way up, right? So losing an entire batch, you know, they've got to be okay with that. Right. Uh, uh, and, and this is the first one where, where, where they've lost basically an entire batch. Um, uh, it's surprising the way they lost it, right? I'd, I'd have, if you'd asked me, I'd have, I'd have bet on a booster blowing up, not on, you know, failing to take the atmospheric density into account. Right. Um, and and so, but uh, but. And so so they're, 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 yeah, go. On. Maybe you can explain to people because we see the headline. Okay, it was destroyed by a geomagnetic storm. What the heck does that mean? Yeah, I, and I, it's a bit misleading. Um, so, so what happens is the Earth is protected by these radiation belts from radiation from the sun, the Van Allen belts, famously, right? Um, and what happens is when the sun burps and sends a whole bunch of charged particles our way, they go down in the aurora, they cause auroras, there's some nice auroras over the weekend, and, and, uh, and then those particles end up bouncing between the North and South Poles, trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, at the same time, the solar X-ray flux and radio flux increases, and ra that radiation uh, affects the upper atmosphere and changes the density of the upper atmosphere. And so rather than the geomagnetic storm, I think the Im immediate problem seems to have been the density of the atmosphere that correlates with it. Uh, and so what happens is that as, the, as you ionize different atoms in the uh, different molecules in the atmosphere that changes the structure of the atmosphere it sort of breathes out a little uh, and so the density at 200 kilometers where these satellites are uh, uh, went up by a factor of two and so now you're trying to fly through a headwind that's twice what it was yesterday okay and so that has several problems uh, one is just if you're trying to raise the orbits of the satellite right your your you know your rocket engine is a feeble little krypton electric thruster and not a big beefy chemical rocket and it's trying to push against a, a stronger side wind the other is that you've got to point the rocket in the right direction so you've got to keep the satellite the right way up and so with a, in a stronger wind, right, the muscles of your attitude control system, the thing that points the satellite up or down or left or right, uh, uh, may not be strong enough to overcome the wind. And, uh, uh, and then the third thing, and that seems to be one, one of the key things is that the, the drag on the satellite due to the increased density, the, the, head, the headwind changes the orbit of the satellite, makes it shrink, makes it re-enter, right? And that would be true even in normal situations. So when you up it, it's gonna re-enter, when you up the density, it's gonna re-enter much faster. Right. And so you had maybe, you know, three or four days to start orbit raising. And now you've only got a day to start orbit raising before you're in trouble. And then you just re-enter, right? And so all of those things together meant that they weren't able to do their normal orbit raising. And apparently they put their satellites in a kind of safe mode, which I infer is what they call the, uh, um, the, the open book mode where they fold the solar panel down so that it's in the same flat plane as the flat panel satellite. And that gives it less drag, mm -hmm. but, it, but there's also less they can do with the satellite in that situation. Right. 
So, and, yeah. Yeah. Some people are saying that this is, you know, proof that their kind of um, orbital debris mitigation strategy works. Well, I mean, certainly, I mean, the reason they're launching to such low orbits is that if things fail, then they re-enter quickly. Right. So, so yes, that aspect of their strategy works. Nevertheless, it's not like we didn't all know that, that we're no longer at solar minimum, that solar activity is increasing. This right. was actually a pretty mild geomagnetic storm from what the space weather folks are telling me. And we're gonna see much more frequent, much stronger geomagnetic storms in the next few years. And so, you know, it seems like someone dropped the ball on, on you know, being prepared for something like this. Uh, um, they, their margins were not strong enough, whether they didn't predict the density correctly or whether the satellites turn out to be less able to cope with that density than they had thought is not clear to me. Um, but I think, so what do you, what do, you do now? if yeah. this is just the beginning, right? So there's an obvious thing, which is they don't always launch the Starlink satellites to the same deployment orbit. Um, this orbit they've used, which is what I call the single burn orbit, uh, the second stage burns once, dumps them in an orbit with a perigee of only 210 kilometers above the Earth. Right. What they sometimes do is they coast in that orbit and then fire the rocket engine again and dump them in an orbit that's more like 270 by 380 kilometers, something like that, where the initial perigee is higher. Mm -hmm. And that requires a bit more fuel. Uh, so if the satellites as heavy as they are right now, and they've increased the weight of the satellites, uh, the, they wouldn't be able to launch the full 49 satellites. They've already had to go down from 60 to 49 uh, with, with uh, increased weight of the satellites. Maybe they're gonna have to go down to 45 and go back to the two burn insertion with a higher orbit. And if they do that, then they should be fine, right? They should, they, they, they drop the satellites off in a higher orbit, even if the orbit is, the density of the Earth's atmosphere drops really fast with height. So even in that higher orbit, if you increase the density by factor two, you're not even gonna notice it, right? It's just that they're so low right now that they, they were pushing, how low can you go? And, and they, they pushed it too far. Uh, for the for the ambient conditions and and so so I think the fix is easy but it's costly right it, it's it's uh, fewer satellites per launch at a more conservative deployment strategy right and you know obviously their launch cadence for 2022 is going to be crazy but you know if if there's a heightened right solar cycle then are we going to see more of these you know kind of satellites destroyed well no i mean not unless they're idiots um, <laughs> you know i mean they're not going to use this deployment orbit again i would think uh, uh, yeah um, like could they have I mean, or, or let, let me let me be a bit more fair to them. uh i, I mean <clears throat> um not unless they're really risk tolerant right, <clears throat> right? so so they can either roll the dice and say yeah, you know, we're only going to lose one out of three of these launches. So let's just, you know, no big deal. Or, or they can say, no, we don't want to lose any more launches. Let's be more conservative and launch to a higher orbit. Those but if they launch to a higher orbit, is there still a chance that there would be, you know, solar activity that that messes up the satellites and then you'll just have space junk? Well, um, the, the, you know, the radiation environment doesn't seem to have been the problem in this case, as far as I can reading between the lines of this very vague SpaceX statement, right? Uh, um, so, uh, it, but it is possible, right? You could have a very strong radiation event that could disable the satellites. But even if you launch to 240 kilometers, you're, you're gonna re-enter, you know, within a few months right you're gonna you can be high enough to avoid the danger of immediate failure due to this what happened this time mm -hmm. but still low enough that you re-enter if the satellite fails in a reasonable time so i think there's a happy compromise here uh that shouldn't be so big a deal for spacex to to go to 
I mean, could they have predicted this? Yes. Um, I mean, you know, you couldn't, there was a, a prediction of a geomagnetic storm. Maybe the density increase was bigger than they expected. Uh -huh. uh, so maybe they couldn't predict exactly that this time it would get them, but they should have been able to predict that there was a risk that uh, uh, if you launch in 2022, you're not in the same situation as launching in 2019, right? And, and you need to be a little more conservative about the possibility of, uh, uh, of atmospheric density increases. They should have been ready for that. And apparently they weren't or not as ready as they thought they were. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, this, I've just seen this kind of making headlines all over the place. And I think some people are using it as an opportunity to criticize Starlink. And so what have, what have you kind of been seeing in terms of, you know, I mean, you've been interviewed about this right H have you yet or oh yeah no this is like yeah my third one today <laughs> okay so what what are people kind of asking you yeah uh, it, it's like well do they know what they're doing well, how did they get caught this way um uh and the answer is yeah that's not clear that's a sort of surprise they got caught um but also yeah people are worried about you know is this is this going to be an ongoing problem for them? Well, like I said, no, because there's this easy conservative fix. So hopefully they'll 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 uh, get past that. Um, is there a problem that you know forty satellites are re-entering uh, in such a short time? Well, you wouldn't want to do that often. It's going to stress Space Force's tracking capabilities. Right. But, uh, um, but yeah, you know, so they're all going to burn up in the atmosphere. So you know, I I, I think it's embarrassing for the Starlink project, but it's not serious. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, you know, oh. again, like I said, every, every big space project has failures in it. Yeah. And, and this is something that is, you know, it got them this time, but it doesn't need to get them in the future. So, so it does mean, I think that they need to go and kind of look at, throughout their system, including, you know, for the operational orbit satellites, have we really thought through the implications of solar max? Do we have good space weather models? Do we know how we're going to deal with it? And we know how important it is to launch those V2 satellites. So with the laser links. So, you know, I believe this was a batch of V2s, right? That's right. Yes. And, and uh, this was going to the, to the group four shell uh so which is basically the same you know 53 degree orbit main shell but it is by like, lower altitude and had the latest laser link equipped uh, uh satellites on it um and and so yeah uh you want those to go up but you know you want them to go up and and, and work right so so if it if if they have to space out the launches slightly more and take some, you know, it's, so suppose they have to go from 49 satellites in a launch to, I'm guessing it'll be like 44 or something probably would be enough to, to get the extra height, you know, so I don't know for sure, but, but suppose it's something like that. Um, so that's, uh, you know, for every eight or nine launches, they have to do an extra launch. How much really of a... Notice that. How much of a bigger hit is it to SpaceX to lose the V2 versus the V1 satellites? It delays the rollout of the V2 service, but, um, you know, again, they're launching every month, right? So, yeah. so it's, it's, you know, I would say it's uh, putting all the effects together. It's probably a hit of, of, you know, one to two months on the overall, you know, ready to, you know, being where they want to be. And that's, that kind of delay, I'm sorry, in space, that's, you know, that happens. Uh, and so I think that, you know, let's put it this way. If their business plan can't cope with a setback that costs them a month or two, then it wasn't a realistic business plan to start with. <laughs> I saw some people commenting on Twitter. They want to see, you know, these satellites re-enter. Is there any way to track that or is that just... <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not getting orbit updates for them. Huh. Uh, and uh, partly that's because we only get the, 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 what we call the sub-TLEs, the SpaceX 
originated orbital data from the working satellites. Yeah. And Space Force hasn't cataloged them individually yet. And so we're not getting the Space Force orbital data for them yet, or most of them. Uh, and so we're getting some predictions and I'll put them on my Twitter feed as I get them. Uh, but, uh, but nothing that's really helpful right now. So short answer is no. <laughs> short answer is not at the moment, but maybe in a day or two, we can do better. And it depends if there's still some of them up. Um, we know that at least one of them came down over Puerto Rico yesterday. Uh, and that was seen by a lot of people. Very spectacular. Um, and there, there are, there are uh, three others that have come down in various spots around, around the world. So they are falling out of the sky. So if you see a satellite re-entry in the next few days, it, it's quite likely one of the Starlings. Uh, although there was a, re a spectacular re-entry over Mexico uh, on uh, Monday that was actually a Falcon 9 upper stage from a launch seven years ago. So, wow. uh, um, you know, <laughs> it, it, there's stuff coming down all the time anyway, right? Uh, and, uh, but yeah, um, uh, I'll, I'll let people know if I, if I get any good predictions. I mean, I know that SpaceX put out a statement, obviously they're trying to be transparent, but did you think that they downplayed anything in their statement? Um, I think that it was a minimalist statement in terms of the amount of information that they gave out as, as is SpaceX and stuff. Uh, um, but no, I mean, I think, I think it was, you know, by, let's put it this way, by SpaceX standards, it was pretty transparent. Uh, and, uh, and certainly they're not downplaying the fact that they've lost, basically lost almost all of this batch, uh, which is, you know, which is too bad. But again, like I say, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's 40 satellites out of 2000 so far. Right. So, yeah. uh, I mean, they've lost others of course, but, but never, never as many in a, at one go. Uh, but it's still, they've still got plenty, <laughs> right. They're not short of satellites. So I think, I think it's, it's, it's fair enough. Do you have any like big questions that you still haven't, you know, had answered yourself about this? I guess it's just are they gonna are they gonna change it so that we don't have more of this in the future? Right. I think I think the question is how are they gonna change the deployment strategy? Which you know I I mean that's fine. I will, will we can wait and find out, <laughs> right? We'll see the next time they launch one. Um, and uh, I would like a little more detail on exactly what went wrong. Right. Yes, the 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 extra density was a problem, but why was it a problem? Uh, uh, was it the attitude, what we call the control authority, the strength of the muscles to turn the spacecraft around? Or was it the time to re-entry, the fact that they were going down too quickly? And, and th those two things are, are kind of not entirely separate. Um, you know, what, what exactly was the sequence of events and why? The other thing is they say it sounds like they put it in safe mode and then they didn't come out of safe mode. So why was that was it that by the time they were ready to come out of safe mode they were so low that again they didn't have the control authority or some other reason was it a software problem um and uh, but the biggest question is why did they not, you know why what was it that they thought they could handle this much density and they couldn't or was it that they really didn't design uh, you know, they really didn't know that Solar Max was coming, <laughs> right? And uh, that's, 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 I think, where, I, where it would be nice to have some more clarity on. So I hope that this helped you guys. I actually had a couple of you reach out to me sending me this article. And so I wanted to get a little bit deeper insight than just regurgitating what people already know. So as always, big thanks to Jonathan for explaining things in a way that we can all understand. And I hope that that helped you guys uh, learn a little bit more about the situation and what we could see moving forward. That is it for now. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. And I will see you guys very soon because on Saturday I'm releasing the video with Scott Manley. Oh my goodness. Uh, a lot of editing on that video. So I hope that you guys love it. And also Saturday evening, join me for a live stream with Dave Lee. That is something that I'm really excited for. So make sure to mark your calendars for that. All right. See you soon.